what if you're the villain of your own story? It's an interesting question. And uh, my wife, being a musical director, choir teacher, I've learned so much about drama terminology over the years from Sherry. And uh, the word protagonist is the word we use to describe the main character of a story who's usually a hero of some type, which means then the antagonist is usually the one that's against the hero, the villain of the story, if you will. And the reason we're asking what if you're the villain of your own story is because what we're going to be doing today and the three weeks after this, we're going to look at the four antagonists of the Easter story. And I would argue that there is no greater story on the planet than the Easter story. I mean, think about it for just a moment. You, you have this um, amazing hero, Jesus of Nazareth, and um, you get his origin story. Uh, a virgin birth, that even though he was this prophesied uh, Messiah, he was born so humbly, uh, placed in a feeding trough. Um, and you got this incredible, uh, even though humble beginning, this incredible journey by these magi, these astronomers from the east who traveled from very far off to just come and worship this child and bring him gifts. And they happened to stop by King Herod on the way and let him know what they were doing, he being a, a horrible, paranoid, power-hungry ruler, ended up finding out where this child was, and in order to make sure no king would challenge his throne, he had all the boys in Bethlehem slain if they were two under the age of two. Jesus literally narrow, narrowly escapes this to Egypt. Uh, Joseph and Mary taking him there, but ultimately he comes back. And we then see in his story how at the age of 12, you can maybe argue this was his teenage rebellion, that he ends up being separated from his parents during one of the pilgrimages they did to Jerusalem, to the temple. And they end up finding him, this 12-year-old boy, confounding the religious leaders with his intelligence and his knowledge of spiritual things. But then we eventually, next time we see Jesus in this story and the gospel accounts in, in the New Testament, here he is uh, getting baptized by his cousin John. And then he immediately goes from his baptism to the wilderness where he, does, he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil for 40 days and for 40 nights. And he comes out of that and then begins his public ministry. And in that public ministry, he did so many signs and miracles and wonders. And then he invites these 12 men known as the 12 or the disciples to follow him. And uh, it was kind of a thing that was done from a rabbi to his disciples, and they became the disciples of this rabbi. But they came to see that he was more than just a, a, a Jewish rabbi, that there was something bigger than that. And they came to believe that this was the Messiah that was prophesied about centuries ago. In, in the midst of all that, though, how many awesome things we see in this story. It was all culminating to this one big, giant event that split uh, human history down the middle between B.C. and A.D. And that was when Jesus, this hero of the story, was killed, beaten, shamefully nailed to a Roman cross. But that's not how the story ended. And the greatest plot twist ever the third day after his crucifixion, the stone was rolled away from the entrance to the tomb and he was not there. And the risen, resurrected, back to life Jesus appeared. He showed himself to his disciples. He showed himself at one point to hundreds of people at once before he ultimately ascended into heaven to be back at the right hand of the Father, leaving all of those who believe in him to carry out his mission until the sequel of this story occurs. You may even call this sequel the return of the king, if you get my drift. What an amazing story. But we're going to take this week and the next three weeks to look at the antagonists in this story. Uh, there's four of them. One of them's very unique, and maybe you would argue isn't quite an antagonist, and we're going to talk about that guy on Easter Sunday in a few weeks. But today, we're going to look at what I would call antagonist number one. He is so infamous and so notorious 
for being a villain in this story that I only know of one guy who carries this name. We still don't name our sons after this guy. Yeah, we'll may, maybe name our son John or James or Peter or Philip, but not Judas. <laughs> Antagonist number one that we're going to look at is Judas. Now, I want to tell you that we don't know a lot about Judas. There's not a lot to know about him, but interestingly enough, He's known as Judas Iscariot. He's called that in the Bible. At one point, he's even called Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And you might think Iscariot's a last name, but it's really not. There really weren't last names in the Bible. You were known as, you know, Bill, son of Brad, or Bill of Harlan County. I mean, that's how I would be known in Bible times. So uh, uh, doing some research in good old Encyclopedia Britannica, we see this about Iscariot. Judas's surname is more probably a corruption of the Latin Sicarius, which means murderer or assassin, than an indication of family origin, suggesting that he would have belonged to the Sicarii, the most radical Jewish group, some of whom were terrorists. Now, we can only speculate what this means about Judas. We are aware that there were radical groups among the Jews who often uh, caused uprisings against Rome. And there's a lot that we can say about that and how the Roman government kind of dealt with that. Uh, But if this was the case about this radical extreme Jewish group, that they were kind of a group known for uprising, I mean, you hear murder and assassins is what it means. It could have been that Judas being named one of the 12 disciples by Jesus kind of gave Jesus some street cred, if you will, that, oh, wow, Jesus is really shaking things up. I mean, he asked he asked an Iscariot to be one of the 12 guys. You know, maybe that, that was considered a little bit edgy for Jesus to have done something like that, that maybe there's going to be big changes coming on the landscape of Israel because of Jesus. It's pure speculation about that. However, uh, maybe his name was more prophetic then it was indicative of anything good that he might do. Now, that's really speculation. What we do know about Judas, even though we don't have really a great origin story about Judas, we don't have a big backstory about Judas, not only in the Bible, but even contemporary history of the Bible, we we just really don't have a lot of detail. But what he's known for is being the betrayer. And we see this in all the mentions of Judas Iscariot in Scripture. I want to look at John chapter 12. I want to read to you the first six verses where we're introduced to the betrayer. It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. I just can only imagine what kind of party this was like, because here's Lazarus, who once was dead for four days. Jesus brought him back to life, and of course, they should have a party in Jesus' honor, and he came to it, so pretty cool event here. But here's what happened next. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Sounds pretty good until you hear this next verse. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So as we go through this series about antagonists, what we're going to learn, and this is why we're doing this, we want to learn what not to do. (laughs) That's why we're looking at these villains, if you will. Because the problem is, what we're going to find is that we probably are just a little bit like these antagonists more than we realize. Well, when you look at Judas Iscariot, who we're calling antagonist number one here, what was his fatal flaw? Judas' fatal flaw was good old-fashioned greed. Good old-fashioned greed. It's funny. Well, it isn't funny. 
that even today in the year 2022, you start looking at some of the evil decisions that happen in the world. You start looking at the foolish things that human beings do and sometimes even the, the, the dumb things that we do, that I do, when you start boiling it down and backtrace, why did that happen? So many times it boils down to this simple vice that has existed since the beginning of sin and humanity, greed. And you know what greed says? The greedy person has this fatal cry, I want more, I want more. Now, that's a little oversimplification, but isn't that what this is? Isn't that what greed amounts to, that you just want more? Now, if you give me a teaspoon of my favorite ice cream flavor and I eat it, I'm probably gonna say, I want more. That doesn't mean I'm Judas Iscariot because I say that. So, so don't overanalyze this and don't dismiss this too quickly. I think a good litmus test is to simply ask this, do I want more when I don't need more? I think the root of the greed problem is a discontent. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure why we battle this so much. Why can't we just be more content? Why are we so tempted by the enemy to get more than we need? I can't help but think of a great uh, story in the Old Testament of the Bible where God was providing for the Israelites as they were wandering in the wilderness with this bread from heaven called manna. It would just show up like dew on the ground every day. And he warned them, only take what you need. And when they, if anyone was tempted, and some were, to take more than what they needed, it turns out what went that extra stuff that they tried to hoard for other days would spoil so quickly. It would be rank, it'd be horrible, it'd be ruined. It's almost as if God was teaching us, even in the story deep in the Old Testament about manna from heaven, that I've got you. I'll provide for you. I'm enough for you. Don't try to get more. It will only lead to rotten things happening. I think he was trying to teach us that a long time ago. But let's think about this for a moment. This is terrible. What Judas was basically doing is stealing money from the offering plate, stealing money from the offering box. He was embezzling from a nonprofit ministry, this people would give donations to the disciples and they used it to help the poor. They used it to meet needs. They used it to be able to do what they did to further the ministry of Jesus Christ. And Judas was had sticky fingers. He was an embezzler. As terrible as that is though, it led to worse, darker actions. So I wanna to turn to Matthew chapter 26. It is in the Gospel of Matthew that we very simply see the act of betrayal that, that Jesus talked about, that he warned would happen. If you look in John chapter 13, it's, it's the story where Jesus washes the feet of the disciples, and he even washed Judas's feet. He washed all their feet, but he was saying, hey, Peter was like, don't, if you're going to wash my feet, you need to wash my whole body. You know, because Jesus said, I must do this. If you belong to me, you must let me wash your feet. He said, then wash all of me. Jesus said, there's no need to wash all of you because you're, you're clean. And he's basically saying, if, if you have faith in me, you're clean. He says, but not all of you are clean. And one of you is not clean, is what he's saying. And if you keep reading the chapter, they're wondering, who is Jesus talking about? Who's, who's this? Who among us is going to betray him? He keeps saying, that's going to happen, but who's going to do that? At one point, the disciple John says, which one is it? And Jesus says, it's the one who I give the morsel of bread. This is the last supper that's happening before Jesus is crucified. And he literally dips a morsel of bread into the cup and he gives it to Judas to eat. And then he goes and says, go do what you're about to do. And even as Jesus said that, you know what? The disciples still had no clue what was going on. They had no idea what he was about to do. They had lived with Judas and done life with Judas following Jesus for three whole years, and they did not see his betrayal coming. But his betrayal happened. We see in Matthew 26, I'm going to read to you verses 14 through 16. It says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? 
So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So that's it. He got so greedy, wasn't enough to take money out of the treasure bag that he was in charge of. He wanted more. And so he begins to plot with the religious leaders who wanted to silence Jesus. I've got a theory on this, and it may be wrong. But if Judas really was from this radical Jewish group that perhaps were trying to make sure Rome was kicked out of Israel, perhaps even assassinate the Roman leaders to get them out of there, maybe that was their goal. And maybe Judas signed on to be a disciple because he believed that the Messiah that was prophesied centuries ago was going to establish a military, political, monarchical rule and bring back Israel to its glory days, perhaps like the days of David and Solomon. And maybe after three years of following Jesus and hearing him talking about turning the other cheek, hearing him talk about the Son of God, the Son of Man laying down his life as a ransom for many, talking about some kind of like, I'm going away from you, but I'll come back to take you to where I'll be. This is not what I signed up for. And so, man, if Jesus ain't going to do what I want him to do, I might as well get something for my three years of following him. It's interesting. What Judas was basically doing was using Jesus to get what he wanted. And I just wonder how many times we do the same thing. Now, what I want to do next is read for you the betrayal that happened. Still in Matthew 26, I want to read to you verses 47 through 50. And here's what it says. While he was still speaking, and this is talking about Jesus. Jesus was talking to the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what, do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. It's interesting. I've heard this. I've read this for many, many years. And for some reason, I've become numb to it. But think about what just happened there. What if you were to watch a Batman movie and the Joker kisses Batman and Batman says, Hey, friend, it just isn't right. It's wrong. It's weird. It's crazy. It ain't, it ain't normal, right? And that's what we're seeing play out here. This man who followed Jesus for three years, sold him out for 30 pieces of silver, kisses Jesus as the final act with Jesus. That was it. As far as we know, this was the last interaction that Judas had with Jesus. He sealed the death of Jesus with a kiss. That's it. I always kind of wondered, was Jesus not easily recognizable by this big crowd, this mob of people with their clubs and their swords? I guess not. And of course, it was before street lighting, so maybe it was really dark in the garden, and maybe Jesus and the disciples looked so much alike. I don't know. But this was the signal that, that Judas spoke of to say, this is the man that you need to arrest. Now, the ending of Judas's story, I, I hesitate to even tell you what it is because it's pretty tragic ending, but I'm going to read it for you. The next chapter in Matthew, Matthew chapter 27, reads, starts with this. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, 
it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. I think it's ironic that they care about, you know, carefully how we spend this money when they plotted to murder Jesus. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Prophecy was fulfilled. An antagonist ended in a very tragic way. What a tragic cautionary tale. It's a reminder of what greed can do. It can lead you to places, dark, dark places, to do things you never dreamed you would do. And it can befall you in ways that only hurt yourself. The greedy antagonist says, I want more. But the penitent believer says, Jesus, you are enough. As I think about Judas's story, I'm amazed that he was right there. He saw all these amazing things. He saw Jesus feed a minimum of 15,000 people miraculously with fishes and loaves. He was there when Jesus said, Lazarus, come out of your grave, and he did. He was there when Jesus walked on water, when he calmed the storm. He saw him heal blind people. He saw the lame walk again. He saw the deaf hear again. And yet, somehow, some way, it wasn't enough. He wanted more. And friends, if we're willing to admit it, all too many times, we're in the same boat. All too many times, Christ is, isn't enough. We're so close. If you're a believer in Jesus and, and you're watching or listening to this right now, how many times can you answer this with yes? If I lose everything I got, it's okay because I have Jesus. If I'm being honest, I don't know if I can always say yes to that. I'm used to my creature comforts. There's so much I want for me. There's so much that I have that I want to achieve or acquire in my life. But Jesus, when you realize at the end of the day, he's everything. All that we acquire in this life, it's not going to be put in the coffin. And if it is put in the coffin, it's no use to us. <laughs> no matter how much we get, no matter how much we achieve for us, what does it matter in the end? What did it matter for Judas? 30 pieces of silver, he slung it. And he realized that it didn't matter. And I'm hoping that maybe before we get too far down in that dark, dark hole that Judas was in, that we can have that same realization. That you know what? We're striving for this. We're hoping for this. We're trying to achieve this. We want to acquire this. And at the end of the day, it's worthless compared to the amazing treasure of having Jesus in our heart, to walking with Jesus, to having faith in Him. I would ask you today, is he enough for you? Now, you may say that Judas is terrible. Man, he is the, he's the devil. He's the enemy. And yeah, Jesus, the Bible even says that the devil kind of went into him and, and had a hold on his life. But before you condemn Judas too quickly, here's a picture of a tattoo that uh, a Christ follower posted on social media, and I saw it. And a lot of my Christian brothers and sisters who get tattoos, man, they, they want to tell a story. They want to bring up a conversation. This picture of this tattoo, Judas ate two. Man, that's going to cause anyone to ask, what in the world does that mean? Do you know what it means? It means that Jesus loved Judas. He served him that last supper too. He ate two. He washed his feet too. He actually died on the cross for Judas. He loved Judas. The Bible says so. And it's just a big reminder that no matter where you are in the greed vice, no matter how greedy you've been or how greedy you are even now, it's not too late. Jesus loves you and it's not too late to turn 
things around. You know, I think of Saul of Tarsus, whom we came to know as the Apostle Paul, whom God used to write most of the New Testament. He was a murderer of Christians. He oversaw the great persecution of all those who believed in Jesus in the first century. But once he realized what he had done, instead of taking his life, he devoted his life to Christ. It wasn't too late, and he realized that. And I'm hoping that all of us, all of us, can realize that, man, we have played the role of villain in our own lives when we've wanted more. We've lacked contentment. We've not let Jesus be enough for us. We've been the villain in our own lives. But you know what? Today, right here, right now, we can say enough is enough because Christ is enough. I'm going to do battle with the enemy and, and, and not listen to the lie that I should have more. I deserve more. I'm going to get more. And instead realize that Jesus Christ is enough. And listen, when Jesus Christ is enough, the things we do have, we appreciate we are stewards of it, and we're more generous with it. And that is a transforming thing. So I want us to just take a moment to pray and ask God to help us realize that by the power of His Holy Spirit, we can turn things around and stop saying, I want more, and start saying, Jesus, you are enough. Father, Thank you for teaching us this cautionary tale through Judas Iscariot. Sometimes we're greedy. Please forgive us when we want more, we lack contentment. And help us to be able to honestly say to you, oh God, God, you are enough. You are my everything. I can lose everything that I own and it will be okay because I have you. Father, help us to get to that place by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. And we'll see you next week as we talk about antagonist number two and learn from that antagonist's fatal flaw so that we can stop being the villain of our own story.